So without further ado, I'd like to move on to the first presentation of the morning, uh, Thomas MacDonald. So Thomas is uh, talking about uh, feeding trials. Thomas is a business manager at Spring Sheep Dairy and responsible for the overall running of the company's farms. Thomas will be presenting work on the trials that the company is running to compare different housing and feeding regimes. Thomas, I'd like to welcome you up to the stage and uh, wish you well for your wedding on Saturday. Thanks very much, Neil, and good morning, everyone. I'd just like to take the opportunity to run you through a bit of what Spring Sheet's been up to for the last year, particularly on farm with our operations and ongoing research. Um, there's been a couple of exciting things happened since we last caught up with you guys, and probably the biggest one is uh, partnering with MPI. So um, great to have their partnership in our farm through the Primary Growth Partnership. What that means is we can now get on and start cracking some of the big issues for the industry, particularly around getting the litres up on farm. So the biggest aspect we've got and we're working through, and it probably dovetails in really nicely with what we've been talking about this morning, is with the ability to import international genetics, we're really in a space now where we start linking that up to the ideal farm system. So how do we start expressing um, the European genetics in, in terms of getting the yields up from where we are today at about 100, 130 litres up to about the 300 litre mark, as we've heard this morning. So. It's important to note that everything we do on spring sheep, um, and you heard this from Scotty last night, is that we always focus on how it affects our consumers, how it affects our people and our staff on farm, and as well as the environment. So uh, it was late last year that we caught up last time, and for those of you who weren't there, we hosted a farm open day at spring sheep where we stood on the hill, and we had a nice outlook of some green pasture, and it really hit me that um, while we were there, it was all nice and green and lovely, and the sheep were all around. This was actually the view, that was our place, but we didn't know what was coming and what actually turned up in a few weeks time uh, from then was a big dry, so we lost a whole lot of moisture and we were very exposed. Um, now that sort of worries us as a company when we're looking at importing European genetics and the ability to feed them year round. Nick and I were fortunate enough to head on an international tour of uh, sheep milking locations and what we noticed was this was their place, so I'll flick back to that last slide, that was our place. That was their place. So there was a few differences there. And as New Zealand farmers, Nick and I felt quite uncomfortable about that uh, environment. So it wasn't um, fully, you know, the New Zealand model. The sheep were indoors 100% of the time. Yet we know that to make the European genetics survive and perform in New Zealand, we need something similar to this. So we embarked on a journey, and our aim was to determine the impacts of feeding systems in New Zealand. Uh, and the, the long term goal is to get the expression of yield in a in a New Zealand context with available feed resources and utilising what we're good at already, which is milking using grass. So our place, phase two. Through um, the research program, we understood that if we're gonna get this yield expression up, we'd need a housing barn, and this is what we ended up with. So it's probably the first time in New Zealand, to the best of my knowledge, that we've got small ruminants housed under a soft roof. This is a simple shelter facility, and it's the largest one they've ever built in the country. So. In terms of barn concept and barn design, we're really pleased with how it's working. And that led us on to a research program. So we're very fortunate um, that the MB program, run expertly by Ag Research, is able to partner on farm with us. And we're able to start looking at how would we understand how best to use the new barn we've got. Would our use be inside 100% of the time, like on the right, or would we use the pasture system? And what aspect will we bring into, into the future system? So to do that, we set up a trial, and uh, it was no small trial. We had four groups of 500 ewes, and what we did is we set out to compare 100% indoors, ewes that were indoors overnight, or outdoors 100% of the time. So we measured live weight, body condition score, we measured the feed that was going into the mixer wagon, we used our in-shed technology to measure fat, protein, and yield. What's more, we went into the flavor, and again, that's bringing the consumer into this. We then measured the walking distance of the ewes each day. We measured if they were standing up or lying down. And then we measured what was the environment like, where were they living? So that was ammonia, temperature, and humidity. And this is some of the data that we got out of it. So uh, each of those little dots you can see up there on the screen uh, represent a sheep, and they're walking around the paddock there. That blue box is our housing barn, and the red box is our milking parlor. So on the left-hand side, you can see that these are the ewes that never made it into the housing barn versus on the right use in the housing barn. And you can see on the left-hand side, we've got ewes walking all the way up and down here. 
for a bit of perspective from the bottom to the top is probably about two and a half k's. So we're at the very outset of understanding the start of it. What you can see is there's a massive difference in terms of the ewes that had to walk up and down the farm versus we're allowed to chill out for the whole day inside and then just walk to a close paddock. What we saw was a massive change in body condition score of those ewes. So the three mobs that were indoors, naturally, being fed goodies and TMR, increased in body condition score versus the ewes outdoors, which lost a bit of condition. The same thing was reflected in live weight, which we saw the outdoor use lose weight and the indoor use increase in weight. It's really interesting when we started using our in-parlour technology to measure milk yields. So what we have is two groups here. The top two lines, the yellow and the grey line, represent our better performers, our elite flock. They were starting at the same position versus the bottom two lines, the blue and the orange, which are our non-elite girls, so slightly poorer performers. The grey line and the orange line represent ewes that were allowed indoors during the day. They came out of the heat of the sun. They were allowed to line the barn and they had access to TMR. And overnight they went out to pasture and lucerne respectively. Versus the blue line and the yellow line. The yellow line being kept inside 100% of the time and the blue line never coming into the barn. So what we saw with our elite flock is actually the hybrid system being able to graze lucerne overnight actually kept milk yield higher than the ewes that were kept in the barn 100% of the time. Another interesting aspect was our outdoor ewes, the blue line, were actually forced to dry off a lot earlier than the ones that had access to indoors and outdoors. The reason for that was, as I mentioned, the big dry came along, we ran out of grass in the paddock and that forced through nutrition and then to dry off. So we're already starting to see some benefits of having the ewes indoors, but maybe not 100% of the time. Some other things we were able to measure were the cell count, the solids and the fat to protein. And I know there's a lot of data on there, but we're, just to say, um, we had a few hypotheses when we started this that there'd be some detrimental impacts to cell count. Looking at that, not really. It's much of a muchness against the groups. Uh, total solids rose as expected throughout the season. And some really interesting stuff happened as we progressed through the trial. We were able to increase the protein or fat to protein ratio through adding different things into the diet in the barn. So once we'd finished with the ewe study, we got on and started thinking about our lambs. And our lambs are all born August, September, October, some in November. That's what it looks like through those months. They're in the intensive feeding system on the automatic feeders. Less than 12 months later, or 12, 13 months later, we'd like to get them back into the milking parlour. So there's a couple of options for how to get them there. We now have a barn. We can put hoggets indoors, or we can put them out onto pasture. So we started running a trial where we put uh, about 1,000 into each system. We're starting to see some real differences in growth rates. So up the top in the barn, we're starting to see 300, 350 grams growth per lamb per day versus the outdoor system sitting around the traditional New Zealand 180, 200 grams a day. So in terms of time back to milking parlour, which is absolutely critical as we start getting into the genetic expression and wanting to maximise each generation, the barn system has some huge advantages for us being able to keep our, all of our stock in milk. So looking ahead to year two, we've got a little bit more work to do. By no means have we cracked the model. We need to start refining the mixed ration based on the international models, but in a New Zealand context. So recognising that in New Zealand we're good at growing pasture crops and forage crops versus what we saw internationally. Uh, but how do we meet the absolute nutrition for those international genetics? This year we were only able to build our barn and have that ready in the month of November which meant we actually lost the ability to either lamb indoors and have pre-lamb feeding and early lactation indoors. So this year we're really looking forward to seeing what happens when we stick our ewes inside at the start of lactation. And I guess the next one and the biggest one that we're all thinking about is preparing for the arrival of the European genetics and as we saw in a lot of the photos there, most of them have been coming from a barn environment. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens when we put them in the New Zealand context. And so we're obviously quite keen to nail that this year. Uh, we will have another open day in 2017 where we'll look to stand on the hill and see the changes in the farm system and probably like to emphasise the fact that we're at the very beginning of a journey with our research partners at Ag Research. We've got a mountain of data we've collected. This year is all about understanding how that works and we're looking forward to sharing that at our open day. And just lastly to finish, I'd just like to mention the team and you saw there that um, it was a a big trial, there were five groups, or four groups of 500 use. So it's a massive trial and I was sharing some of these results with the team and they said, 
So it's pretty much like that body condition score graph. Some guy comes up with a trial and he sits in his office and his body condition score goes up while we run around with 2,000 years losing body condition score. So um, a massive thanks to the team led ably by John Rory and some of them here. So they're the best ones to catch up with if you'd like to understand it a bit more. So thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Um, we're running okay in terms of the allocated time, so we've got time for a couple of questions if anybody's got any. Thomas, Thomas uh, sorry, are you allowed to tell us what the additive was that you put in that changed the fat to protein ratio? Uh, it was just a bit of canola. Thanks. Thomas, just wondered if you'd uh, done any calculations on the cost of uh, per kilo of feed having them inside versus outside. Yeah, totally. So um, we're buying all our rations and either um, made on farm, which costing us about you know anywhere from ten cents to get it in the stack, or bring in at thirty cents. So y yes, there is a cost to the ration, but as you, uh, I didn't have a photo of the dry, if I could have put one up, I would have. But there's nothing in the paddock, so we were forced into a feeding situation, regardless. So. Yes, there is a cost of adding TMR to the system, but you've got to do it. Hello. Um, do you think about going into all your round um, milking now that you have the barn? Yeah, that's definitely something we'll be looking to do as, as we start to get the expression of the genetics and uh, taking the seasonality up. And it's also something that we look at as we extend into different formats of products that we'll start going to a year-round model. Okay. Oh. okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Thomas. Yes.